This is Fede Gaumans from Software for Chemistry and Materials. In this video we will look at how you can use ADF to calculate X-ray photoelectron spectra. Uh, the process whereby you have a high energetic photon kicking out an electron from one of the core orbitals. And with ADF you can calculate all the core orbitals for all the elements in the periodic table. Let's have a look at an example and compare to the lit uh, literature from uh, a paper from 2017 from the group in Priesta, a long-term ADF developer and user, Margo Steiner, who's looking a lot at, at X-ray uh, absorption and uh, photo photoelectron spectra in this case. Um, and here's a study where they look at short-chain oligothiophenes. We'll look at a very short-chain one, namely the monomer, so just regular thiophene. Um, and we'll look at the peaks that we get from calculating um, the removal of an electron from the 1s orbital from carbon atom 1 and carbon atom 2. And we'll compare that to their results as well as the literature. So let's start with uh, looking at thiophene itself. Uh, so you can just draw it by hand or you can import a smile string. In this case, I know in our Cosmo REST database we have thiophene so we should have a pretty good structure here so let's select thiophene parenthesis ADF uh, that means that it has been optimized with scalar Zora uh, TZP basis set um, and pretty good integration settings so this should be a pretty good geometry we'll use that and now we will create um, a system whereby we can specifically remove an electron from carbon atom 1 or from carbon atom 2. In order to do that we need to create a specific region for each one of them uh, one after the other and we'll do that in model regions and we add this carbon atom to region 1 which we'll call C1 and that atom will give a slightly different basis set than all the other atoms which makes it much easier to identify which exactly is the core orbital of that carbon atom. Uh, we'll also use the becker purdue GGA scalar Zora, always a good idea um, if you don't need spin orbit coupling explicitly and as a standard basis set we'll use triple zeta width polarization and a small core. Uh, so that will be the default and uh, for this particular region we will modify that so we go to the details basis set and core per region and here we will set uh, for that region the basis set to TZ2P um, which is typically something you'd want to use for uh, these type of, of spectroscopic properties of these core electrons um, and you can go even higher quality, so quadruple zeta with four polarization functions or these even tempered basis sets which have specifically been defined uh, for this purpose by Professor Del Chong. Okay, so let's stick to TZP in this case. Um, run a single point calculation and since we want to be able to remove one electron we want to have a different set of orbitals for alpha and beta electrons and we need to run a unrestricted calculation. Um, let's run this and we'll get a warning which I'll explain later. Um, so we call this uh, Tiophene C1 single point and it warns us it's an unrestricted calculation with no spin polarization. Okay, that's fine. Um, so now it starts to run. So the reason it warns us is uh, because we don't have any um, unpaired spins, it doesn't really make any sense to run a, a, a spin unrestricted calculation. It's only more expensive. Um, unless you run, run specifically a broken symmetry solution, then you could run a singlet state using an unrestricted calculation and get different results from just a restricted calculation. In this case we want to run it like this because then it becomes easier to define the core whole state. If you already know what you're doing then you can explicitly set the occupations in the run file and just run the run file as is without using graphical user interface. Okay, now we want to prepare the different uh, carbon atoms, so carbon atom 2, um, and for that we'll just change the region. So we go to model regions, 
um, remove this atom, so it's selected now, remove that from that region, and we will add carbon atom 2. Sorry, I didn't want to make a new region, I want to add it to this region here, and rename it C2. And let's go to the basis set details now. And indeed, we now have this all electron basis set selected for carbon atom 2. So let's save that as thiophene C2 SP. Save it. We get the same warning. Uh, but that was intentional. So we run that. And the other one is, is finished. So we can prepare that one for the core whole state. So I click on the ADF here. That will open another ADF input um, window, and then we can start uh, tinkering with the occupations in, in this particular molecule. All right, so let's wait until that is. We get the same warning again. So now what we want to do is we want to modify the occupation. So we go to model spin and occupation and now it's smart enough to already know that this calculation is finished there's a tape 21 file which contains all the um, all the information including the occupations um, and in this case i'm pretty sure that the 1s uh, orbital of that carbon atom is the lowest symmetric state, uh, but if we want to be 100% sure, we can click on show levels here. That will give us the orbital level diagram. And now we can look at the occupation of the that particular state. So um, we need to zoom out all the way, all the way until we get to the first orbital here, and that's going to be really, really deep. So it's going to involve quite a bit of scrolling. That's our second state here. Um, there we go. So we can see that this first symmetric state uh, consists 100% of the C1 carbon atom. We gave it a specific name. It's 1s orbital. And that is also depicted here by this line. So we want to depopulate let's say the beta electron of that um, and so we get specific occupations and if we go to the main panel it will also have automatically um, increased the charge to plus one and spin polarization to one because now we have a uh, cation radical we will save this as thiophene c1 hole okay and let's run that job. And then in the meantime, we convert to this here. We want to do the same trick. We want to go to spin and occupation. Um, and automatically, again, it reads in the tape 21 file. We set, we remove one of the, the electrons from the lowest orbital. Um, and again, save that as a different file. So C2 hole. There we go. And we also run that job and since it's running here locally it will be put in the queue so we'll need to wait for the other job to finish. And it can sometimes be a pain to um, to properly uh, uh, converge these core whole states. I think in this case it shouldn't be too much of a problem. So for those of you who prefer to run from the command line, we can also have a look at the run file here. So we can see this is our system where we have a specific carbon atom type that has a different basis set, so an all electron triple zeta with two polarization. Um, and here, either specific occupation. So what that means, so the occupations per irreproducible representation, irrep, uh, AA, that's a symmetric um, irrep, and AA, A, so, or A double prime, that is the anti-symmetric one. So we want to have 14 uh, of the lowest orbitals in the alpha uh, manifold occupied, 
but the first one in the beta manifold we want to have d occupied and then we want to have 13 occupied so in the anti-symmetric manifold we want to have 4 and 4 alpha and beta electrons so if you already know uh, beforehand this is going to be the orbital that we deoccupy and, and for that particularly using uh, specific regions or atoms that have all electron bases set so then you're 100% sure that your lowest orbital is going to be coming from that one and not from the, the other elements um, then you can just set up your, your run file uh, without having to use the guess and occupation tools in the graphical user interface all right, so our C1 whole state calculation is finished. We open up the log file, and here in the bottom, we can find the bond energy. And so that is the energy with respect to the fragments, um, so the neutral fragments that we started with. And we do the same for the neutral system. So we click on that arrow there, look at the log file, and then we compare these two values here. And so let's ask Google let's ask Google how much the energy difference is. So 237 electron volts minus minus 53 electron volts. Uh, sorry that should be minus minus 53 so 290.6 for carbon atom 1. Let's compare that to our spectrum calculated here. So carbon atom 1 is indeed around minus 290.6. Let's go back to ADF jobs and let's do the same for carbon atom 2. Let's have a look at that binding energy here, 237. 284 and compare that to the neutral state which is minus 53.013 um, that should be pretty close of course to the other one so it's slightly different ever so slightly different basis sets all right so that's 290.3 and as you can see indeed the c2 uh, XPS peak is at slightly lower uh, binding energies. Um, let's have a look at the table here. Um, so actually in this paper they also have a difference of around 0.3 EV uh, but it's slightly off from the experimental results so um, actually in, in our case we're a little bit closer to the experimental fit um, and that's why I think in this case they also mentioned that they shift the spectra by uh, minus 0.2 EV. And that's not uncommon for XPS as well as NEXHAVs and, and Xane's calculations, uh, where the absolute energies can be a little bit off. Uh, that's due to the uh, Zora relativistic Hamiltonian. Uh, you can also use X2C, usually it gives slightly better absolute energies, but in general, uh, the relative spectrum, which is beautifully reproduced here by these calculations, um, is pretty well uh, reproduced by just regular scalar Zora. Okay, so that concludes our little demo on how to use ADF to calculate X-ray photon electron spectroscopic properties. Let us know if you have any questions, if you have any comments, um, or if you would like to see any other type of applications with ADF. Thank you 